Research increasingly shows that the tryptamine alkaloids in various active mushrooms affect us differently, depending on the unique composition of each species. While hundreds of thousands worldwide are cultivating cubes at home for their therapeutic benefits, a growing number are turning their attention to other species for their distinct effects. The challenge? These other species are not as widely cultivated. But tonight's guest is changing that. He has made a remarkable impact in the online community dedicated to perfecting the cultivation of wood-loving mushrooms. And here's the exciting part. It's easier than you might think. So get ready to take your grow operation outdoors with the one and only Jack Cyan. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast. A podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator, advocate, and educator. Every week, he sits down with fellow cultivators, mushroom educators, scientists, and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Myco Geeky Podcast, the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game. I'm your host, Myco Geeky, and we have an amazing show for you tonight. We're going to sit down with Jack Cyan. He is from the Pacific Northwest. He grows wood lovers outdoors, and he does it well. Uh, he is a legend in Wood Lovers United, a, a Facebook group dedicated to growing uh, wood-loving mushrooms. Uh, before we do that, though, let's go ahead and do what we usually do. We've got a lot of people to thank, right? Uh, you know, to put this show on every week um, takes the support of, of amazing people, people like my Patreon supporters. You guys are absolutely making this possible for me. I, I cannot say that enough. If you want to consider supporting me on Patreon for a month, for two months, for as long as I'm doing this, which which hopefully is for a long time, um, just go to Google, type in the word Patreon, type in the word Mike Ogeeky. Uh, it's as easy as that. I, I would really appreciate it. I also want to shout out all the people on my Discord, uh, my Discord mods, uh, and, and the people that just participate and play a role in keeping Discord a great place to learn uh, how to evolve your grow, how, how to answer those specific questions that sometimes content uh, on YouTube just can't answer. So I uh, really appreciate you guys. And uh, of course, today, uh, I, I, I think we can't not acknowledge it's Memorial Day. Uh, it's a sad day for a lot of people. A lot of people uh, lost their lives trying to defend uh you know, the freedom in the United States. So shout out to, you know, my grandpa and, and countless other relatives who uh, either died at war or who served and, uh, you, you know, came home with more than just uh, a hat, right? It, it, it takes a lot to, to serve our country, to put yourself in that situation. Uh, military life is not easy, uh, whether you see active combat or not. So uh, shout out to everybody who's, uh, you, you know, served in the U.S. military, uh, really cannot say enough for um, the, the sacrifice that that takes. Uh, I, I'm thinking of like three or four people that I know pretty well right now who served, and uh, whether it's PTSD, whether it's uh, some other way that they figured out to cope with uh, some of the stresses of that, they, they, they have definitely paid their dues. So uh, just if, if that's you today, uh, can't, can't say enough for what you did. And hopefully we can, um, hopefully this, this mushroom medicine can, can play a role in, in helping your, your recovery or getting back, uh, something you might've lost serving. Um, and for those of us who have lost people, uh, you know, just take some time today to honor them anyway. All right. So Jack Cyan. I, I tried to get this guy in the show for a while. Finally, uh, you know, the stars aligned and it was meant to be. So let's bring him on the show. All right. Welcome to the show, Jack Cyan. What's up, man? What's going on, buddy? Man, I'm I'm super excited. I, I, I'm not going to lie. You know, I'm I'm excited to sit down and talk to just about anybody who wants to talk to me, you know, for a couple hours about mushrooms, but particularly excited to be talking to you tonight. That is for sure. So thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. I, I cannot wait to get into it. Thank you for having me. 
All right, man. So let, let's not waste any time. We got a lot to talk about. Um, we got, we, it's customary. We do it with everybody. I want to hear your first mushroom memory. Go, go as far back as you can. That first earliest memory of mushrooms hitting your radar on any level. All right. Well, back when I was, um, I think I was, I had to be around five or something like that. There was this, uh, there was this movie called the bear. Um, I don't know if you remember it, but, uh, it was about this, uh, it was about this bear and, um, he got, he got separated from his mom and he was out in the woods by himself and he ended up eating an Amanita. And, um, he saw like, you know, it was all scary and he saw all these like shadow creatures that are like, you know, shadow beings in the trees and stuff. And he got super scared. And, um, I always remembered that. I was like, man, that was scary, but I want to learn more about how that happened. I want like, I mean, I was just a little kid back then, but that was definitely like the spark that fired me off. So now how old were you when you saw that movie? I don't know, maybe six. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't remember how old the movie is. And like, I don't even remember the rest of the movie. I just remember that one clip of it. Honestly. I love that. That's all you remember. You're like, there was a bear and there was an Amanita mushroom. That's all I remember. Yeah, that's cool, man. So now you're, you're, you're kind of in the Pacific Northwest. So I imagine from a pretty early age, you, if you're out in the woods, you saw a lot of mushrooms. Honestly, I only moved up to the Pacific Northwest about a decade ago. Um, so, yeah, so what really, like, um, so, I mean, I've always been interested in fungi, but there wasn't a ton of it growing where I was at. Um, I, I was living in the California foothills, and, um, I mean, I, I saw some, when it, I lived uh, for a short period of time when I was younger in uh, Humboldt County in Fortuna and Eureka, and I did see some mushrooms and stuff, like, you know, while I was, you know, crawling around in the woods back then when I was a kid, but, um it was really once I moved up here to um, the or to Oregon on the Oregon coast that I just started seeing them everywhere. And I needed to know, you know, I was like, what are these? What are they for? What do they do? Like, you know, what are they related to? And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's really when it kicked in. I like that you said you're seeing all these mushrooms and you're like, what do they do? And you just told me this seminal story about you know this movie where you're like these mushrooms can do stuff like they're if you eat some of these some will just you know nourish your belly but others will will do some interesting things and and you definitely like growing the mushrooms that do interesting things so we're 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 going to we're going to completely get into it so so you moved to Pacific Northwest you're seeing all these amazing i mean first off if people have never been to the Oregon coast it's it's phenomenally magical it, it it really is a magical special place you can watch goonies and, and get a little tiny touch of, of what it's like up there but yeah it's pretty amazing so so you got inspired from from your location to kind of go further so now bring me from that point of you being in this new area being inspired by what you're seeing to cultivating mushrooms well honestly at that point i just um seeing so many things like you know in the fall it's like seeing you know exotic flowers or something you know it's just that like they're all so beautiful and like i just wanted to know what they were so you know i started getting on um i started doing a lot of identification getting in on in on all the identification groups and then i found out that you know that there was you know a lot of uh psychedelic fungi that grew up here too and i really wanted to find them and um so i ended up you know Finally finding my first sign essence, uh, and it was in a really odd spot. It was like on the top of this dirt hill, and there was just one growing there. But like, you know, that was like one of the best moments of my life. I was. You like, found one alone. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like okay. My first sign essence was just one singular sign essence, and um, of course, I, I, I mean, I'm sure you've done foraging, but like, once you you could be searching for years for something and not find it, and as soon as you find it you'll start finding them more often. So um, that season was pretty exciting for me. Um, the next the next um, find I found was, um, and this was this is just in the park that, that was back behind my house during the time. Um, my next find was uh, I found some growing next to the trail. I was like, oh boy, it was like, you know, it was more than one. I was super excited. <laughs> like, you know, there was like five of them there. And then I looked down kind of like down the hillside, which was actually just brat 
just blackberry brambles all the way down. I saw more of, more of them going down than the blackberry brambles, and like I just jumped right down in there. <laughs> like I ended up falling in a hole and getting all scratched up, but I crawled up and then just found this like giant patch growing this little alcove down there. And uh, yeah, it was amazing. I was I was talking to my a couple of my buddies during the time and um, and uh, yeah, I let them know uh, what I was doing. Took a bunch of pictures and stuff. But that was definitely that was. Um, when I definitely caught the psilocybe bug. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it? It's like uh, the same way that universally speaking, people love a murder mystery. They love a detective story, right? They they want to solve a riddle, right? When you're out there looking for these mushrooms and you finally find some, it's so ephemeral, it's so rare, it's so fleeting that when you, man, you stumble down a, hillside in some brambles and you you find just just the giant honey pot it's a cool man it's a good little dopamine hit for sure yeah yeah there's nothing like it there's nothing like your first find agree everything i don't for me i just found uh i, I was hanging out with my kid uh behind her school they have a new little like learning lab area and um, she's like oh dad i just found a mushroom and i'm like oh cool i look i'm like oh i've never seen this one and I, it's not too uncommon it's a uh, northern cinnabar polypore but i never found it before so it was cool yeah just seeing a new morphology of a mushroom you've never seen yeah but your first find your first grow i mean that magic it's like that's it's it's huge I mean, even if it's, you know, even if it's just your first grow of Cubensis on PF Tech, you see that first mushroom pop out, and you're just, I mean, like, that is just pure magic. Yeah, agree. I mean, it really never gets old. Even it, it, I, I don't care how many times you've, you've grown a certain cultigen. It never gets old. Uh, a great flush never gets old, no matter how good at it you are. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun it's it's special and and i've i've said this before i really feel this like when you find them in the woods you know you find them in that moment and then you have to you're either going to leave them or you're going to pick them and then you've disturbed their their life cycle at that moment whereas when you're cultivating them at home you get to watch that whole process and it's uh absolutely it's, it's so cool man uh love it love it love it all right so cyan essence was that first find that kind of got you hooked. Now, while you were doing this and you started forging for cyanescence there, were you growing cubes? I was growing cubes off and I mean, I've, I've grown cubes off and on for the last two decades, but like it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it was nowhere near like a professional level. It was just, you know, like back then it was just like spore syringes to PF tech, like, you know, every so often when I needed them and it was like, you know, enough for me and like my buddies and stuff. And like, you know, it was fun, but like, it wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't truly get into it until I started really, um, yeah, until I started really foraging up here. But yeah, I've never been much of a cube guy. Um, when I first started getting into the community, I, I, I ended up, uh, you know, I, I joined in with like on the Shroomery Facebook group and these other cube groups and stuff. And I would, you know, present ideas that they hadn't heard before and stuff. And everybody would laugh at me and like, you know, like put me down for whatever, like for saying this or that. And um, it almost like ruined the whole cultivation side of it completely for me. Like I almost just quit right there because I didn't, I was like, well, I thought like this was supposed to be an accepting group of people, but like these people were just like, oh, just follow the tech. And it's like, what tech? There's there's hundreds of tech techs, you know, like which tech am I supposed to follow? Like and like and so I ended up just um, saying screw it and um, not down for following techs anymore. I want to blaze my own path. So that's kind of uh, what led me to where I'm at now. Cool, man. Yeah, I mean, you're not the only person that's had had a similar shroomery story. It's really too bad because they all those guys love mushrooms. They they love cultivation, but it seems like a lot of them, or at least a, a percentage of them, love being right and love telling you you're wrong more than they love actually figuring something out. So it's yeah. that's unfortunate. Well, they 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 just like follow they follow the rules. Yeah, you know? right. They follow what somebody else told them to do. Somebody and told me uh, to do this. Yeah, and like if you're just doing what somebody else is doing, you're not actually learning anything. Right. 
Yeah, I forget. Somebody recently told me uh, I said something about FAFO, and they go, "Oh, well, lots of people FA, not a lot of people FO." And I was like, <laughs> "Oh, you are right, dude. Not a lot of people actually. They might fuck around, but a lot of people do not find out. So, <laughs> a- amen to finding out. So, and, yeah, and absolutely. Anybody that uh, is on Wood Lovers United, which is a very healthy, thriving Facebook group for people who are growing not cubes. And typically, I, I think it's not always wood lovers, but it, it is usually wood lovers, outdoor grow, stuff like that. Some people trying to grow indoors. Um, it, if you guys have been on that group, then you know Jack is absolutely one of the heavy hitters in there. He's figuring a lot of stuff out. He is definitely doing the, the FO of FAFO. So you're you're foraging, you're finding these mushrooms. Was it a natural progression to go, cool, I found them, but I, I want to also grow them? How did you make that step from foraging for it? Because, I mean, cyanessence is everywhere up there. Why make the next step into kind of controlling that that outcome? Well, it was um, it was kind of a it was a, kind of a slow process at first. I mean, I, I foraged for years, um, I, uh, and um, I um, my next uh, big find, you know, I, I found a, a lenii here at a local ter- church, and I found a azurescence down the just down in the middle of nowhere, down this crazy dirt road that goes down to the beach, and um, but the lenii patch, I I tried those and those were just incredible. And I, I I had only found them in that one specific area, and I wanted more. Like you know, like if, like what I found wasn't enough. Um, so I ended up taking um, because like at that point my cultivation experience extended to the uptech. So I took a I took a wild print and I and I um put it into a shot glass with some distilled water and then uh, put it in a used syringe that I uh, boiled. And then um, I, and then I shot it into um, some PF tech jars that I made. And like, I think like half of them pretty much just turned into straight up contamination. And the other half, like there was a couple that like made it all the way without any contamination. And then like a couple of them that had like half contamination. So I just mixed those into chips and, um, that was my first successful grow. It was just straight wild print spore syringe shot straight to PF Tech cakes. And like, that's when I realized that I was like, you know, this doesn't have to be as complicated as everybody thinks it's like it has to be. Like the, the lab work is definitely essential if you want to do it right. But if you just want to do it, it's not that hard. It really isn't. So that first one was with Alenii? Or was it with yeah. the Cyanessence? Yeah, uh, with Alenii. Well, so, like Alenii and Cyanessence um, and Azurescence, but that was my first year. But my first, okay. uh, my first uh, try was just with a straight Alenii print. So too. now, once you PF teched them, so you're saying that you took all those to wood chips, whether they look contaminated or not, or you just yep. took the you did. Okay. Well, I, and, I I cut out the contamination off the cakes, and then I just put the the put put the rest up. of the cake to chips, and then just okay. blew up. And the contamination, well, we can get into that later, but okay, yeah, cool, man. So so alunii, cyanessence, azurescence, all foraged wild genetics. You 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 take them to to a grain, and, and then grain to wood chips. Now, at that time, and trust me. You don't have to spend much time in Wood Lovers United to know that 90% of what everybody's talking about is either sourcing wood chips or what kind of wood chips to to source. Where was your head at at that point where you're like, okay, I know these are wood lovers. I know I got to get some wood. Like, how did you go about making those decisions at that point? Well, I mean, I'd, I've been part of Wood Lovers United for a while, so I knew, uh, you know, um, and I, I I did other research and stuff, so I, I mean I, I obviously knew that like hardwood chips were the go-to, um, so that's what I looked for. And um, a friend of mine got a like a load of uh, it was silver maple chips, uh, and um, yeah, so that's that's what I used off the bat. I was like, and um, you can source those from, uh, or you can source any chips from your local arborist. Um, you just call them up. You can get on you can get on the chip drop program where you kind of just get whatever they drop off. I mean, you can you can request hardwood chips, but you don't know if they're just going to come with a bunch of leaves and stuff. Like, uh, my suggestion is to either just keep your eyes open, pay attention to what type of trees are out there, 
um and uh keep your eyes open on like you know when something's being chipped up where it's at when you're just driving around and um you know you can you can specify what type of chips they are from the leaves that are in the chips and um and just kind of uh yeah figure it out from there but uh, i do know this so we got family out in oregon and uh one of my wife's cousins she married an arborist so like arborists are definitely a thing out there y'all got a lot of trees and you guys yeah. tend to take care of them um where i'm at man it's like pulling teeth to get these tree trimmers to cooperate they're not going to tell you you got to bug them every single morning where are you going to be at sometimes mm -hmm. they'll call you back sometimes they won't but if you are persistent and you reach out to either arborists or tree trimmers or you know just actually put in some freaking work you can find and source free or nearly free quality hardwood chips i that's that's my belief yeah sometimes you just have to kind of bug them and like befriend them you know don't don't be a don't be a jackass about it but be like hey you know, like you know <laughs> i'm here if you want me to throw you some bucks i'll throw you some bucks but like these are specifically the types of chips that i want and like you know if you can drop them off that would be great and uh yeah just be friendly about it don't be a dick just like everything else you attract more bees with honey yes exactly all right so so tell me about how that first year went like l l learning points things that went well, things that didn't go well, what did that first year of trying to cultivate those go go like? Well, uh, that first year, um, I lived uh, in the spot that I lived at, there was a, there was a fence and then, and on the other side of that fence was this giant blackberry patch. And um, I, um, so I actually, I undid a couple of slats out of that fence and then I, and then I cleared out an area in there that was like, I don't know, it was like, like probably eight by, 15 feet or something like that and i made all my patches back there um so like you know they were nice and hidden and they're on the other side of the fence they weren't on my side of the property or anything and uh uh yeah so i made my patches back there just um with chips that i had like with the chips that i had like i made the spore syringe and then i expanded that to chips and then i expanded those chips to more chips and then you know i dug the i dug the the flats out there about four inches down and then layered them down kind of like a lasagna style and um and then topped it all off with a um, straw so now what you you layered you were doing the the wood chip spawn layered with what cardboard or straw what were you no i'm actually kind of a um i don't like cardboard because of multiple reasons for one it has basically zero nutrition in it whatsoever for them um, the reason why uh, the, the reason why I like stem butts and stuff run crazy on cardboard is because um, they're searching for nutrients and it has none. So it throws out, you know, those crazy ropes, those those crazy rhizomorphic ropes just searching for food. So uh, and like and if you leave them on there for any period of time, they'll just stall out and die. Um, so I don't really use cardboard for much of anything. Um, it's basically trash. <laughs> as far as i'm concerned <laughs> and <laughs> yeah and and it's and, and not just that but in in the in the processing uh in the processing process like they they add all types of chemicals and stuff to it so i mean it has all kinds of like forever chemicals and all kinds of nasty shit up in there so i just stay away from cardboard like as much as i can so and, so uh, what were you layering it with then the the spawn the wood the oh yeah you put down and... yeah you well you put down you know like you put down a layer of uh, wood chips on the bottom just to give it like a base and then you put the chip spawn on top of that and then you put wood chips on top of the chip spawn and then you know a thin layer of dirt and then repeat and the, you know so you so you do like chips chip spawn chips dirt chip spawn <laughs> or wait but you get the <laughs> you idea already, i get it Sorry. <laughs> yeah oh that's a that's a tongue twister yes all right, so that's cool. Um, I th I think that's I I don't even think it's worth debating. I've heard many people talk about cardboard, but you know, just you're right. They definitely treat it with chemicals. There's no possible way it can be good for <laughs> for. for no, people think it's some type of magical like mushroom food, and it's 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 basically wood that's been pulped and then leached of all the other nutrients, right. and just it's yeah, it's trash. Yeah. 
Well, and and probably t- so to kind of go on the whole folklore of the unproven folklore of cultivation practice is, you know, like you're saying, I think I've seen a post where you use the cardboard just to isolate something because, like you said, it yeah. throws these rhizomorphs so fast, you, you can actually isolate something out pretty fast. Um, they probably put it on there and said, well, look at these ropes, right? Yeah. Like, God, look, they love it. And you're like, no. Well, yeah, look how much it's growing. <laughs> you like don't it, understand like... rhizomorphic growth then. <laughs> yeah. No, what it's doing is panicking. It's literally freaking out going, where the fuck is the food? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right. So, so that was your first year. You, you, you dug down a little bit. You, you did, did the, the lasagna at the, when you finally did those several layers, did you put leaf litter back over it? Were you trying to plant a little herbaceous ground cover? What did you do beyond that? I basically just, um, I just kind of put straw, straw over it. As um just kind of a yeah, I put straw over it and I I still do that to this day and, and um you know it just kind of leaves a uh, it leaves some food source up there and it also leaves kind of a microclimate um in much the same way like core or something would work um just like something to kind of hold in the moisture and give the uh, mycelium a chance to get up to the surface and start doing its thing. Right. So now that first grow first year, what was the season like? When did you start that bed? I, I believe that I believe that I start yeah I started those back in I think like April because back then when I was first learning I was listening to other people and I thought that's that was like the cutoff like I had to make my beds by then or they weren't going to work. Cool. So you start so you you do the beds. Did did you water them? I mean, you guys get a decent amount of rain there in the spring, right? <laughs> like. Yeah, we get a decent amount of rain in the spring, but we get almost no spring through or no rain through the summertime. Like between like, you know, say like June and September, we basically get no rain at all. So um, I would say anywhere, um, you know, like you you want to water things, but you want to water them just to, like the right amount. You know, like you don't want to like flood like if just like any other type of thing in the garden. You don't want to just completely flood it. So, um, yeah, I like. And that was another thing during that time, like everybody was saying like, oh, no, don't water your patches. And like, I was like, my patch is drying out. I'm going to water it. Like, so, yeah, so I did because like, you know, it, I mean, if, if the patch is in the perfect spot where it gets the perfect amount of moisture and stuff, then you don't really need to. But it's always beneficial, like at, at some point to give it some water, you know, don't let it dry all the way out. I mean, it can dry all the way out and it can come back, but you're not going to get nearly as good of a flush if the, if you let it dry out because the, it has to recover. Yeah, it takes a big hit. Yeah, that, okay, so that's that's good to know. Now, so th- you place this behind your fence. Um, was there like a bunch of tree cover? Was it pretty exposed? Uh, well, I mean, it was behind the fence, but it was it was it was surrounded by berry bushes and stuff, so it had some shade, and there was also a large spruce tree nearby, which gave it some more shade. But uh, uh, yeah, you want to look for um, if you're looking for a spot to make a patch, you want to find a spot that's um, not completely in the shade, but mostly in the shade. Like a little bit of sunshine is good. That little bit of warmth that it gets from the sun, maybe say like in the morning or whatever, but that's that's perfect because it's like it like a little bit of sunshine is good. But like if it's a completely exposed, it's just going to dry out. Or if it's completely exposed, same thing in the winter time. Um, even though it's so wet, just it being completely exposed out there to the winds and stuff are not a great. Um, it's it's not a great place for cultivation. Now, where you're at, you does it ever get below freezing there? Um, on the coast, it uh, on the coast it does, but rarely. Um, like it, it. I mean, it does. Like you know, a few days out of the year, and in the odd year, you know, we'll go through a week of like actual freezes. Um, but for the most part, it's it's not that much of an issue. Inland, it, it freezes a lot more which will shorten your growing season, but it won't kill the mycelium completely. It just kind of kills the mycelium on the top because here in Oregon, we don't get the super deep freezes. All right. I like all that. Okay. So first year, did you get fruits? Yes. Amazing. So did you get them in the fall or did you get them at some point in time in the summer? No, I definitely got them in the fall. Um, The, the, the local Slosby species that grow here are all fall fruiters. Um, 
except for um, well, ovoid EO or yeah, ovoids and um, stuntsii um, will grow in the springtime as well, or will they'll fruit in the springtime. Um, okay, so first year out of the gate, success. So you you had fruits from three different uh, forage wild genetics, and I'm guessing you were just freaking hooked at that point. I was absolutely. Um, the azurescence. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of a funny story. The ad, like because like you know I heard azies were the best and blah blah blah. So like you know I wanted to make I, like so that's what I put most of my energy into. I made three patches of um, azurescence out there. And um, the uh, they didn't fruit at all, except for one spot in my um in my largest azurescence patch, where a dog had somehow gotten into that area and took a dump. <laughs> <laughs> so a dog took a shit in there. I was like, I was like, what the hell? And I found dog shit in the middle of my patch. So you know, I picked it up and threw it in the bushes. And uh, but that yeah, that azurescence didn't pet like the, like that patch. That whole patch didn't fruit except for that one spot where a dog took a dump, in that one spot. And there was like one dense little cluster that grew right there. Um, and that's actually where the genetics of the azurescence I am growing today are from. Is from that one little clump that grew, <laughs> thanks to uh, thanks to dog shit. <laughs> Shout out to dog shit everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Not just for cubes anymore, guys. Not just for yeah, cubes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that that concept I've heard repeated by several people where you know you're you're trying to cheat the general rules of the genetic a little bit, where you're going, all right, if some fluke event occurred that was favorable and allowed for fruit, my God, clone that. And, and see if if there's something a little bit different, a little bit special going on there. See if it fruits more readily. I, I'm assuming that was the idea. Like, okay, cool. Absolutely. I, I cloned that little clump, and um, now it's um, now it's the first one that comes up when I grow in the what well, like it comes up in what was it? And this last year came up in late September in the greenhouse while it was still summertime conditions, basically. So I mean, it, it was. It, um, yeah, it was kind of mind blowing. It came up uh, when I mean, soil temps had to be up near 60, 65 degrees or something still because it was in the greenhouse. And uh, that was the first one to start fruiting. And I was uh, very surprised by it. Yeah, that's early, man. Holy cow. All right. So, first year, cyanescence, alenii, azurescence. You got fruit from everything. You got the dog shit cluster clone. <laughs> um, all right. So, so then year two, where's your head at? Like, uh, of course, more, 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 but, but walk me through what you did your second year. I, I was doing a lot of learning and a lot of networking stuff. And, um, I, um, but, uh, and during, during the start of a uh, year two, um, I made friends with a lot of people out of New Zealand. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I added a bunch of New Zealand species to the repertoire. Um, uh, so I had a subruginosa. Subsecotyoides, um, and unfortunately, my wearer uh, culture never really panned out. Yeah, the subaruginosa and the um, subsecotyoides uh, definitely were um, amazing, amazing fruiters, and um, and uh, one of the subsecotyoides and the subaruginosa seem to have crossed, um, which isn't supposed to happen. And and wood chips, right? Because they're both uh, dicarions. All right. So so through no credit or fault of your own, they were just growing near each other, and what seems to be a cross from the two came up. Yes. Yeah. Um. Because I, like I, I only had one. I only had one type of um um subseco growing, and uh, I planted it on both sides of uh, my subaruginosa patch. And on one side, it came up with these long stem fruits with uh, more of a, you know, the like subcolored caps, and they were completely sterile and um, very, very potent. Um, but I only had one sub type of subseco, like, and it was it was the typical type that is uh, kind of looks a little bit more like Wero. It's kind of more pale, grows really close to the soil. Um, you know, like um, partially partially enclosed caps, but the one that grew on the other side of the 
yeah, that suburban SI I grew up with grew completely different. Wow. I mean, but that's the uh, never say never. I know that's that's the thing of that's the thing about mushrooms. Like we want to try to classify them, we want to put them into little boxes, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they will defy that over and over again. I mean, it 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 it, it happens that way with genetics. It happens that way, you know, with uh, you know, like uh, just identification in general. You can find two that have and share the exact same DNA, but look and grow under completely different circumstances. And uh, you can, and then you can find, uh, you know, find two that share um, that, you know, have completely different DNA, but look exactly the same and grow in the exact same place. It's, uh, I don't know, we have to, we're, yeah, some work needs to be done there. There's I mean, uh, something. Always at the end of the day, I always think this, they don't give a fuck what we call them. They don't care if we <laughs> figure it out. They don't, you're right. They're just doing their thing. This is all our problem because we want to study them. We want to figure them out. We want to label them. We want to, yeah, all that stuff. But it's true, right? It's a weird thing, man. We we talk about this a lot on the show where we talk about the fruits all the time, but, you know, it would be like talking about an apple, and, but never talking about the apple tree, right? But the apples come from the apple tree. So the apple tree is the thing. Fruits are just one aspect or one part of its life cycle so and it's the same with all this at the end of the day the mycelium is way more fascinating than the fruits we love the fruits of course yeah but man because that's what we get to see because you know we're on top (laughs) exactly we are on the 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 top side yes all right so you didn't do anything different on your your bed tech or anything by year two you just if it wasn't broke don't fix it yeah no it was basically the same i just kind of um i just did it in a slightly different area ended up doing it in my yard and in a planter bed and a planter bed that i built race bed active mushroom gardening that's what i'm all about right there that is great now so but this was open did you do like any of the little tunnel tent stuff was there no I, I, i honestly it was completely open and um that was uh yeah maybe i should have explained earlier on but i really haven't been in the game as long as uh, a lot of people might think um this uh this last year was only my third year of a of a successful patch um nice but i have been working out techniques to make things easier and easier um as i go on and uh to you know make it easier for anybody to do the same i love it I mean, I know guys that have played basketball for 30 years and they can't beat guys that have played basketball for two years. So (laughs) I I, I personally, I respect people who have been doing anything for a long time, but I also respect people who are accomplishing a lot in a short period of time. So I, I think there's many different ways to look at that whole deal, right? Two, two years of doing something one, one time a week for two hours is not the same as doing it for one year, eight hours a day, every day for that entire year, right? They're just not the same thing. So, and then your willingness to just go for it, man, if you just watching you has taught me anything, it's you can sit around and on Facebook and argue about what works and what doesn't work, or you can shut the up and you can go figure it out and you're always coming back going well i did a thing and here's what i did and then everybody wants to debate it all day yeah and that 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 should just i mean crazy. like like uh yeah i mean what it comes down to is like uh you don't have to do everything the right way like uh, like me personally you know like that like i'll hear somebody tell me how to do something the right way and they'll tell me why I shouldn't do it the wrong way, but they won't explain why I shouldn't do it the wrong way. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to do it this way and I'm going to figure out why it's wrong. And either, you know, either I actually do figure out why it's wrong or I figure out that they were just full of shit, you know, and it was the right way to, or maybe not the right way, but like another way all along. I mean, all I know is they're every day all day they're in the last three years i've been around here there is always somebody every day if you're spending any amount of time on social media there's always somebody who's going to tell you what you're doing wrong oh yeah absolutely every day and i'm sitting there going (laughs) well 
I'm doing it. Keep telling me what I'm doing wrong. I don't know. I haven't seen your pictures. What are you doing? <laughs> like, I, and, and hey, if, if that person came at me and said, you're wrong, I'm going to show you 50 pictures to prove why. I'm going to tell you about the nine experiments I did and gave me a lot of useful information and seemed like it came from a place of experience and thoughtfulness, I would go, oh, thanks, man. Thanks for saving me, you know, the trouble of figuring that out since you already figured it out and you explained it so well. But it's Absolutely. never, it's never what I'm getting on the internet. No, they're just like, you're wrong. And they're like, why am I wrong? Because it's wrong. It's because it's not the way that I do it. Bill so-and-so, Bill Smith told me one day, well, why'd you listen to that guy? Well, because everybody else listens to him. Okay. Cool. Good for you. Well, I'll just keep doing it though. Let's keep getting through it. I'll just keep having things work out. And you just keep telling me how I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. I, I really respect that about you. Um, put up or shut up, do the work, figure it out. This is all stuff that, that evolve what we're doing. Nobody's sitting around coming up with 80 reasons why not to do something is ever really figuring much out. I mean, if it works, it works. I mean, if, if somebody's strapping, you know, if they're just strapping filters to their box fan and like using that as a flow hood, if it works for them, it works, man. Like, I'm not going to stand here and talk shit because like, you know, I paid six hundred dollars for my hood, and like they paid forty for theirs. Like if if it's working in there, then it, it's working. Man, I know guys that have both. I know guys that have the Mac Tens, and they have their old box fan. And there are times when they don't want to go downstairs, don't want to kick on the fan, or don't want to kick on the flow hood, and they're still using the the. So like, hey guys, a lot of tools for a lot of situations. Whatever works for you. Why do you want to tell somebody what to do so bad? That's what I cannot figure out. Like, I think people are just salty because they spent too much money on their filters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I know a guy who saved up his pennies. He had like 500 bucks. He came to me saying, should I buy this two by two flow hood? I said, no, dude, save your money for a two by four. But in the meantime, why don't you just go spend a few bucks, make a broke boy fan. He makes a broke boy fan. And he saved up all the money and then he messages me one day and he goes, yeah, man, I got the money for this Mac 10, but like, I don't know, this fan is working out just fine for me right now. Like, <laughs> do I need to buy it? I go, I'm not telling you to buy anything. You know, when, when you need it, you'll buy it. If you don't need it, why buy it? To this day, that was like two years ago. Guy still just using this box fan tech. Looks great. Yeah, it's yeah. good stuff. Now, I, probably like you, I love my two by four. I love my space. I love to stretch out my arms. I love to be able to lay all my crap where I need it. Absolutely. Um, so so I like I, I like the flow hood for sure. Yeah, I am a big fan of my hood. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to, I'm not a door-to-door -door salesman about them, though. You, do you need one? You do not need one. You do not need one. If you don't want one, I am not going to try to talk you into getting one. So year two, you added in some uh, New Zealand uh, wood lovers, and they just worked great. Yeah, they work just like just our, like our native species. They can all grow exactly the same. That is amazing. Um, same, same, same cycle, right? Like you establish the beds in the spring, you tend to get the fruit in, in the fall. Yeah. But I, I learned that you can start doing them a little bit later. Like you don't necessarily have to do them in spring. The most important thing is that they, um, is that they work through most of their food before um, fruiting season comes along. If they have a bunch to eat, then they then then they won't want to fruit because the mycelium is happy. Like you were saying earlier, the mycelium is the tree. The mycelium is the organism. So I mean, if the mycelium is completely happy and just munching away down there, it doesn't have a reason to fruit. Like, so it has to, it has to start reaching the edges of where it's running out of food or it has to start running out of food to start fruiting. So, I mean, like if you put fully colonized spawn out there and just mix it with dirt, you know, in uh, say September, it will fruit for you come October. Wow. I like that too. I, I like, I'll tell you, especially why I like that is because I also, we have some summers that can be pretty dry. We can go easily a month and a half with not a drop of rain. And 
it's too long and I don't want to have to go water all my beds all the time. So if I can start those late summer or early, early fall and, and still get fruits, that is. I mean, you can start them like that's that's the beauty of uh, uh, wood lovers is uh, you like you can start them whenever you want. I mean, you could start them in winter, you know, like once that starts, um, you can expand them to wood chips and tubs and keep expanding in tubs and keep expanding in tubs is until you have as much as you want or as little as you want or, um, you know, and just keep making patches all year long if you like. And uh, like yeah. That. Um, I forget who it was. You probably know who I'm talking about. I think he's from Europe. I could be wrong. Um, he uses those little like cannabis cloth grow. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe he was like he was he was growing like cyan in his little foyer or something like that, right? Yeah. And, and then uh, so I, I don't know if we're talking about the same guy, but there's another guy who, when winter came, he had a spot under his deck that I guess he dug a little hole out, and he would drop his little pots in cover it with leaf litter they'd easily survive the winter i guess it's like i don't huh. know wisconsin or somewhere like that but somewhere where they get like brutal winters yeah and just by digging a hole covering it with leaf litter it makes it through and then come spring he just pulls them out and sets them he actually has like space inside his garage he he leaves them in the garage lets them sort of acclimate a little bit and then and then brings them out waters them and lets them get a little air and gets flushes all the time and i was like okay there there really are a lot of different ways to do this you might not have land right to do these beds cool you can you can still do outdoor grows in these little fabric pots that's you still have options which i yeah, like thinking absolutely. about you know not not everybody has the same living situation not everybody has a fence they can knock two boards out and you know, uh, get some gross back there. So you got to figure yeah. out how to make it work for yourself. That's part of what's fun about this hobby, in my opinion, is it's not like if I if I'm in a basketball, if that's my hobby. What do I do? I got to buy a basketball. I got to go to a basketball court. That's it. That's the level. There, there's no other way to do that. You got to hit a basketball court with a basketball to play basketball. For growing mushrooms, there are so many species. There are so many approaches. There are so many limitations you have to work within. That makes it a more, for me, a more interesting situation. Yeah, man. Me and the rest of the exotics community, we're working that stuff out. And uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff happening right now. We're we're getting it figured out. All right. So year two went off without a hitch. A lot more fruit. I'm imagining you're you're still out foraging. Were were you the year two, I'm imagining you still did cyanescence, selenii, azorescence. Were you using the same cultures or were you then using clone cultures from some of the fruit you got from that first year? I was, um, I was actually, I think I was actually just using, um, I was still using multi-spore cultures uh, year two um, because uh, I don't know, I kind of like end up doing everything over again every year but i think even uh let's see even this last year the well the only thing that's been the lenii and the azorescence have been clone cultures the whole time everything else has been started from spore year over year and this last year let's see which one's the right culture there was the yeah i think it was just the azorescence and the lenii so everything else you're going back to spore and so you're you're literally making an mss syringe and you're inoculating the fermented wood chips with spores oh no no okay, no I, okay. I, I, I do i do all the i do all the lab work um you do okay, absolutely okay. yeah right. no it's it's a yeah no i do all the lab work i, I go from you know spore to right, right, uh right. to an agar plate and then i take that agar plate and clean it up and then i go to liquid culture and take that liquid culture and uh, i use whole oats because i'm cheap <laughs> and um and then from yeah then from the whole outside go to wood chips but like yeah after after it gets out of the lab nothing is sterile whatsoever you know after the grain point like it goes to fermented chips and uh like the beauty of fermentation is um you actually use like you use chips from outdoors i used to like i, I like to throw a couple of uh spoonfuls of uh, native soil into the mix just to add in that uh you know that uh, that microflora and fauna in there and it creates some, um, you know, like the fermentation process also creates a balanced ecosystem. 
So oh, you, I love that. I never thought about just adding. So you're adding soil from where you're going to establish your beds. Yes, but uh, the native soil from from that area, and there's there's a there's um there's fungi and bacteria that can be both and um what is it aerobic and anaerobic. Um, but yeast is good uh, example of that, and um, so all these uh. So all these microorganisms, they they break down the chips to the point, and then they just slightly break down the chips, and they take all the oxygen out of um, out of that uh, container, and all the um, all the more complex fungi, like you know that that would be like major competitors, uh, they all die off because they can't go anaerobic like the like the like the microorganisms do. So it basically kills off anything that can compete in any major way and then just leaves but it still leaves this uh like this tiny little microbiome of stuff that can uh you know like because like when you're walking like for example like when you're walking around you don't see just mold just growing all over everything you know you don't see mold growing off the dirt you don't see like you know mold growing on on trees or like you know branches and stuff that's and there's like there's a reason for that part part of it's just environment you know you have you wind you have wind you have uh you know the uh, uv radi radiation from the sun but a large part of it is all this stuff underneath that we can't even see at all so i mean like if if you take um you know say because a lot of people think we just ferment chips to like you know basically sterilize them or like they like or pasteurize them or something, but it's 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 a completely different process because if if you take sterilized chips and you put like you know partially, uh, say put partially contaminated grain to them, it's just going to turn into a big old mold forest. So this like, and then it's all going to die. But if if you do the same thing, you put them to fermented chips, because that balanced ecosystem. You know the the predator like like the predator molds and stuff they can't take over because there's a whole ecosystem in there that balances it all up and takes care of it. So that's a huge part of like that's really the cornerstone of what I do is all of, like behind keeping the ecosystem that you're working with balanced. So you saying that made me think about this. Um, I, when I was working on uh, some Zaptocorum grain spawn, I started experimenting with how long to ferment my chips. Um, I And in, so far, I've figured out there's definitely not long enough, and there's definitely probably too long. Did you Have you done any experimentation with that, or have you kind of always fermented for a certain amount of time? There is no such thing as too long. There is no upper limit. Um, uh, because uh, part, part of what the process does is um, it preserves the chips. Like it, it is literally fermenting. What you're doing is literally fermenting. If you if you look into the fermenting process of basically anything, what it comes down to is preservation. You know, it's like for for like from like a human standpoint, the reason why we ferment stuff is well, for one, for flavors that come out, and for two, to preserve it. Um, so like so if 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 you let it ferment and you leave the lid on there, it just goes dormant. Uh, think of uh, say they have um like trees that they harvest out of the swamps down in Louisiana and stuff that are like, you know, hundreds of years old. That wood hasn't broken down this entire time. And the reason why is because it's been stuck down in that anaerobic, uh, you know, environment, which is exactly the same thing that you're doing when you're fermenting chips, you're cre creating that anaerobic environment. So, I mean, I haven't used chips that are more than like, I don't know, maybe a year old because I end up using my chips, but uh, yeah. But theoretically, they should be able to last if if you keep the lid on and they're not getting oxygen, new oxygen coming in, then those list those chips should be able to last as long uh, as okay. you want. See, I said that because I ran, I think one I did one week, one month, three months, and six months. And I just noticed a trend of the wood definitely got way softer. And and, hmm. and there was a point where I watched the the colonization rate sped up. It was faster the longer it fermented up to the three month point, but then the six month chips, it it wasn't faster. I don't think it was that much slower, but I just thought, well, theoretically, you know, you it would just keep going and keep breaking the wood chips down. But I I'm sure you're right that it's sort of the fermentation process, it is a preservation dynamic. It it will hit some sort of equilibrium. So in that all was was there was there fresh oxygen getting into the container you're 
fermenting I mean, in? I had a, I bought a little five gallon food grade, you know, white five gallon bucket yeah. from Home Depot with the screw top lid and all that. I mean, it was, I don't think it's like perfectly hermetically sealed, but it was, yeah, I wasn't opening them until I hit my, my time, but, huh. but no, I, I still, you're still right. I, I was making an assumption that it would continue on that trend and it would just keep breaking down more and more. But I think you got it right when you're saying, but you're, you're in this. And when you open up the, the three and the six month ones, right? Like you get that nice little fermented smell. Oh, God. Obviously yeah. there's some. Yeah. Real ferment. <laughs> yeah. It's, a smell. it's definitely not a nice smell. It, it, it's, no. it's uh, I guess it's an acquired taste. Yeah. You get used. It's not like a, it's not the worst smell you ever smell, but it's not. Oh, it's pretty point. bad. It's not I don't bad. know. Yeah. Man, like, uh, yeah, fermented alder is gnarly. It, it's, uh, yeah. it reminds me of uh, when the dog shit in the middle of my <laughs> azurescence patch. Yeah. yeah, it's bad. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an emergency room nurse. I have smelled some smells in my day, so I guess it doesn't quite compete with some <laughs> of that. Can you smell that smell? Yeah, uh, but, but yeah, it's not pleasant. You you can definitely tell fermentation is without a doubt occurring. Uh, you got some little natural woody kombucha going on in there for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. You get a nice little scoby on top, and you know it's good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, right, but most that's... people see that and they freak out. But uh, yeah, no, uh, the the bad smell is um, a good sign, and yes. um, luckily you can just leave that stuff out outside in the sunshine and let it um you know dry to the the perfect amount which is uh moist but not wet you don't want to leave any uh, moisture on your hands and but at that point once it gets that point and it's been oxygenated that smell mostly goes away yeah so, yeah. Yeah. yeah so you don't have to deal with it long term so now do you i know i got guys who just drill 100 holes in a bucket and let it drain that way um, I think I've seen a video where Paul Stamets has a little spigot and he drains a barrel and then he, I'm guessing he just takes off the top. Um, what is your approach to drying the, the chips? Um, well, it depends on how prepared I am. If I, if I, if I know a couple of days ahead that I'm going to need a certain amount of chips, then I will just, I will, um, cause I ferment in trash cans because, you know, trash cans are pretty cheap and they're the perfect vessel for it. Um, so if I know, uh, you know, a good week ahead, I'll just stab a couple of holes in the bottom of the trash can with the screwdriver or drill, or what have you. And then I'll just let it drain with the lid on and, um, and then just leave it like that, you know, until I need it a couple of weeks later. And then at that point, it's at the perfect, uh, it's usually at like the perfect amount of hydration. You know, it's, it's been fully drained out. They're not wet. They're just moist. And that's perfect. If, if I need to use them sooner, then I'll usually, I'll put out a tarp. And I'll lay them out, you know, on the tarp. I'll, I'll just take what I need out of the bucket, lay them out on the tarp, and let them dry out in the sunshine. Um, it's a little bit more difficult, obviously, in the wintertime because you don't want that stuff, like, drying or that stink in your house. And I have that stuff, like, drying out. But you can use your garage, put a heater on them, whatever, you know, make a screen. Um, it's, it's basically just uh, getting them to the right level of hydration is the most important part. So for you, yeah, when I was doing it, I, I actually I farted around a couple ways, but I finally just took an old pillowcase, filled the pillowcase up, tied a knot, hung it above a, a, a bucket and just let it drip for a day. Um, but, but what are you looking for? You're looking for where you can tell those wood chips are damp, but the, you don't want them like glistening, right? You don't want them yeah, so wet. Yeah, they're damp, but if you handle them, you don't want any water left on your, on your skin. Okay. okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so that's that's the perfect point. At that point, when there's no exterior water on the chips, that's when they're perfectly hydrated. So then you're inoculating wood chips always with some sort of grain spawn, the 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 oats. Um, well, yeah, that's the way I do it now. Um, it's it's not. I mean, it's not the only way. I I don't like saying that anything is the only way. I'm not saying that I am the most right or anything like that at all. I mean, if it like I said, if it works, it works for whoever like figures out to, to do it the way that they do it. But that's the way that I currently do it. Like I said, I started out with PF Tech with just spore syringes, um, to wood chips, um, which worked great. Um, grain works better because it has a uh, you know the the because there's just higher packets of a uh, nutrients for the for the mycelium to feed off of um so you're gonna have you're gonna end up having a you know 
you're going to end up having a stronger mycelium that's going to um, expand faster. Uh, and uh, yeah, but like I, it's not always grain to wood chips because a lot of, like most of the time it's wood chips to wood chips. So you know, like once once you have those wood chips all the way colonized, like they're good and they're pretty much bulletproof. Like you could just keep on expanding those wood chips as much as you want over and over and over again. Every time you know it's all the way colonized again, just put it to more wood chips. And when you make a patch, hold some back and then put those wood chips to wood chips. And like you know, and it's it's just uh. Yeah, you can make a uh, one. I think I figured it out. Uh, you can make one quart of grain spawn into. I think it was something like fifteen yards of wood chips in a year, <laughs> if you're on it. Wow. Yeah. Now, have you heard of anybody? Because these are just a couple things I've been thinking about. So if I'm in the winter, I I can go. I can colonize my grain. I can then take that to, you know, I could go buy some little uh, like smoker wood chips if I wanted to, if I didn't have anything available. And then I could expand them to those wood chips in a bag so that then when spring comes and I get at some wood chips, I can ferment them real quick and start making beds. Have you heard of people doing that? Do you think that's necessary? Is that a stupid idea? Uh, no, I mean, that's that's fine as long as everything stays nice and sterile. Um... You know, if, if you sterilize the wood chips and like, you know, your spawn is sterile and everything, then yeah, it's it's perfectly fine to go from grain to sterile wood chips. And you can, like, it would be, but it'd be like kind of like a grain to grain kind of thing, but it'd be like grain to wood chips. Once it's in those chips and like, and once it's fully colonized those chips, those chips are strong, but like until that point, they're not. Got it. Yeah, that. so that's my thought. My thought is I could just have these chip bags just brewing, just just getting bright white and super happy and chocked full of, you know, mycelium. So that then in the spring, I'd have, like you're saying, these like supercharged wood chips ready to go to expand. Um, I, I think in talking with you tonight, one thing I'm my takeaway is much like for regular mushroom cultivators that are growing indoors that are growing at a larger scale they're doing a lot of grain to grain transfers you know it's just it's dependable it's fast it's trustworthy um that there's there's something to be said for the like you said wood chips to wood chips you know you just keep it going you got one little wood chip you could put that in a bucket and that that might even be enough to <laughs> come back a, a month later and it's fully colonized off one chip yeah, but as long as you just if as long as you keep sterilized chips, um, or not sterilized, but uh, colonized chips, like you know, in reserve, you can just keep on expanding those. Um. Yeah, and, and my thought was, you know, you get these, you you buy a little two pound bag of alder wood chips for a smoker. They're clean, they're sterile. I mean, maybe not perfectly sterile, but they're essentially pretty close to sterile, and you're you're gonna have a real good chance of getting those really colonized well, supercharged with mycelium. So, so whatever you're, you're working with in your garage or wherever you're keeping all your buckets full of, you know, fermented wood chips, you just, you're kind of give them a head start. That, that was my thinking. Um, yeah. I, I tried to, I thought I could do liquid culture. I thought, here's my idea. I'm a, I'm gonna make some real great liquid culture. I'm going to just squirt it all over these wood chips. That did not work out so well for me. <laughs> no, no it's, it's, it's not the, yeah, it's not the best method. I, I tried to skip a step. It did not work. Yeah, no, it's uh yeah, no, it really likes having that grain to jump off of. Yeah. It needs that home base. It's like a home base for it. Yeah. Where it says, well, I need some time. You can't just throw me naked into these wood chips here, you know, in, in my liquid culture it doesn't work. So, all right. All right. So then year three, what, what species did, did you move into? Year three, um, by order. Let's see. I had, um, I had the subaruginosa, the New Zealand subaruginosa from the North Island. Um, and, uh, then I had, um, to the left of that, I had subseco, um, subseco tyoides. Um, and to the left of that, I had cervica, 
which un unfortunately didn't end up fruiting very well. And to the left of that, I had another subsecotyoides uh, patch that was um, the the um, the cross. That was a cross between subsecos or secos and uh, subs. And to the left of that, I had uh, I had a lot of like a uh, because half this stuff, like I didn't have much time because I moved into a new house. So I didn't have much time to um, uh, create whole new patches. So a lot of what I had was dug up from my old patches and they ended up being kind of half this, half that. Um, so yeah, so I'd had another subseco patch. Then to the left of that, I had a Lenii, then Cyanescence, or, and then Azurescence, um, the Indian Wood Lover, and ovoidiocystia. All right, so year three, you you added ovoids year three, you added cyanescence year three. Um, tell me about this Indian wood lover. I don't. I, I I've I've lightly heard rumors and little little mumblings about you know there's some stuff in India. Tell me that whole story. Okay, yeah. So uh, uh, the Indian wood lover was discovered by Anand um, Chamgapa. Um, down in um, south uh, southwestern India, um, down near um, the equator. So it's a it's a, it's a very um, very like wet tropical area during the summertime. They fruit during the monsoon season. Um, and then was uh, and then was polite enough to send me a couple prints of those. And um, yeah, so I got those started, and they um, yeah they fruit they fruited excellent within the greenhouse during the summertime. Um, I had a fogger on on there in there keeping um you know keeping humidity up, but i I grew them the exact same way I grow any other wood lover. It just happened to be a different season so um, a little a little warmer, a little more humid basically yeah okay. they liked it uh dark, warm, and hot <laughs> or dark, warm, and humid. What are we up to? Let me do the math here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven or eight species. Now you had a move, so that I feel like that that the plot thickens with that, because now you're 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 taking like you said you took some old chips from from an old bed, moved it somewhere else, um, and I think I've seen you talk about this on the the Facebook group about sort of things intermingling and mm -hmm. kind of what what that year was like. Why don't you yeah. talk a little bit about? the so, interesting uh, things that were learned <laughs> so yeah this this last season was definitely like uh my most fruitful of any of them um mostly because uh i i had, I had transferred everything into a greenhouse that was at my old uh, at my new house it was a stick built greenhouse with um with glass windows um but uh yeah, I was able to fully control the climate in there unlike you like you know you can't do that outside like here in the pacific northwest we have wet 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 winters you know, like you know it just rains and rains and rains and rains and rains and like when you think it's done raining it just rains more <laughs> yeah, there's, there's you know, the it, forecast for this afternoon is <laughs> rain with an additional chance of more rain yes <laughs> yeah but uh like so i mean there is such thing like i know we all know that like you know fungi mushrooms they love water but there is such thing as too much um so being able to have that greenhouse and being able to cut down on that water helped a ton. Um, so it's a really good uh, fruitful season because I, I mean, they started fruiting early. They fruited super late. I think I was harvesting my last azurescence in March. Anyways, it also gave uh, ovoids are not, um, the ovoids and the Indian wood lover are actually in the same family, kind of uh, over on the Cuban CI side. Um, but they are wood lovers. Um, but the ovoids, uh, ovoidiocystia, um, in particular, are incredibly aggressive. Like they, they ended up growing from one corner of the greenhouse, invading multiple beds, to growing all the way to the other corner of the greenhouse. And this is a 16 by 8 greenhouse, so they grew 16 feet across, like you know, like in like the center, the center part was. Uh, chips that weren't getting watered so they were able to make it under the dirt and like through those chips 16 feet to the opposite corner of the greenhouse and start fruiting in my um in my seco patch wow. uh but you did so, have you did have simultaneous fruitings so it didn't necessarily kill them yet right no not yet 
but okay. like they like they they're in the process of taking over everything for sure That's like this, they they, they they cannot coexist so i mean okay. if uh, like if if you have your patches separated as as far as like the as the one as far as you um so for the subseco or or the subaruginosa section subaruginosa sign essence whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. um you can put those side by side as long as you keep them separate, or you can put them side by side in this, like you know, in the same year. But next year, one of them is going to win. Um, you know, if you put them both out in the same year, then you're going to get a patch of this and a patch of that. The next year, you're probably going to get a patch of one or the other if they're right next to each other. But the ovoids, they will take over everything. <laughs> and if and if you want a super easy fruiter that's just going to like you know invade all your flower pots that are on the ground or whatever. Oh, voids are the one for you, for sure. That's funny. Yeah, my my buddy Happy, he, he last uh, fall, he he had a bunch of chips. He was planning on doing real formal chip beds and everything. Never got to it. Didn't want it to go to waste, so he just dumped some in, in you know behind his house, and then he dumped three other buckets behind his brother in law's house or his I think it was his brother's house. And he said this this fall everything fruited like slammed just he did nothing he dumped the bucket out that was the prep and and came back in the fall and just hundreds love that guy by the way hi happy oh yeah he, he he's a cool <laughs> guy he's a cool guy yeah um so ovoids right at first you're looking for them and you want to find them but if you're cultivating them this is a good warning uh and boy that's fascinating to hear that if you start some of these at the same time together you're good that year but the next year is, is going to be war war of the fungus and yeah somebody's going to come out on top especially ovoids you got to watch out for those things that they, they became invasive like it, it got to the point to where i mean like i mean I, I i'm moving again from that house unfortunately so um but like i mean it got so i'm not i'm not doing it like i thought i was going to but i was going to tear up the entire floor of all that stuff and like just get it out of there so I could start over again. So now let, let me just so I understand this correctly. So you have a greenhouse, but they're not growing on like a raised bed. They they were no. in the ground. Okay. Yeah, they were ground level. It was a dirt floor greenhouse. Any thoughts of trying to put some of these on shelves, like to see how much of it is only dependent on the outside of it all versus the being in the ground of it all? There's there's a lot of like other exotic species and stuff that I want to get up on the shelves and like pots and stuff. So um like I mean like I I know wood lovers do well on the ground and there's there's a lot of stuff that does well in pots. You know like there's a uh, Angulospora out of New Zealand that does well in pots. Uh, yeah, um, he here in the states uh, you can find stunts yai growing out of pots. Um, and uh, all right, so that's your plan. You got you got other real estate plans for that that higher up. Yeah, we're talking. Yeah, we, we're we're talking about multi-level, you know, there you go. <laughs> systems going on. It. Yes. Yeah. All right. So Serbica still not working out for you. No, I'm restarting Serbica this year. Um, I'm doing Serbica Bohemica. I think I was doing. Um, I was trying to do Arcana. I actually did get two fruits out of the Serbica um, culture that I had. Um, but I did a microscopy on it and um, and took a close up look at the um, Bisidia, Sisidia, and um, the spores, and it I determined it to be a cyanescence or section subroganessa. So um, yeah, so it was not yeah, it was not cervica unfortunately, and it did not fruit well. Um, so this year I'm starting over with uh, cervica bohemica, and hopefully uh, we'll get some good fruits out of it come fall. Nice. So now I'm assuming that you don't just grow these, look at them, say bye bye, and throw them out. I imagine you've experienced all these. Do you are you comfortable talking about how you your interpretation of the experience of these different wood lovers? Oh uh, yeah, that's fine with me. The floor is yours. Whatever you want to say, I, I I won't lead it one way or another. But I'm sure there's a lot of people. You know, a lot of us have only had cubes or maybe pans or maybe a couple people recently, you know, grown some zaps or tamps or whatever. Um, but a lot of these wood lovers, most of us have never had. I, I have never had them. So we, we'd love to hear any thoughts on them. 
All right, so by far my favorite would be Eleni. Um, they are the most therapeutic species I've ever tried. They're they're they're, they're a species that when you when you take them, I mean, like you just feel like everything is going to be all right. And if you start to feel like things aren't going to be all right, it will physically yell at you inside your mind if I give you a little kick, like, hey. Beep, like you know, be positive, asshole. <laughs> like, um, I love that and, like, you had and, an impersonation and, of Eleni. That's great. <laughs> uh, like, what's and, your fucking and, problem? Yeah. No, but seriously, if I mean anybody who's had like a a, a sig significant amount of experience with this species will tell you the same. Like they are, they're by far an extremely therapeutic mushroom and i think that they should be more uh, more widely utilized like I'm, I'm not sure like you know i don't know i'm not honestly nobody knows how um how the different alkaloids react with each other and like how that really works out but i mean across the board from anybody i've talked to with eleni i will tell you that they are probably the best as far as just like an overall experience um and then, like you know, like the uh, the the azurescence and the macarori kind of give you like I don't know, kind of a fuck around and find out feeling. Just like you want to fuck with me, I'll show you. And um, the cyan essence are kind of more earthy. Um, they're good and nice. Um, uh, oh boy, dios, I see. Uh, uh, those give me kind of a cubensis feeling uh for me personally it's kind of a heavy body load and i have um i have issues with uh like hallucinatory uh tinnitus um where it's just like this noise that's in the background if i'm by myself and there's no music going on or anything it can get um extremely overwhelming and um i get a lot of that on the ovoid so personally i'm not a fan yeah but that's that's the generalization yeah. of half of them nice. so <laughs> well Definitely, man. I've been sitting on a Lenny culture for a hot minute. Now, now you got me. I'm, I'm gonna absolutely have to give these a try. No, they're very, very underrated. Like, well, like, but people just don't know. You know, they're, they're not a very flashy mushroom. They grow kind of, they're kind of short and they grow ground like, like close to the ground. It's hard to get like, you know, good decent picture of them. Like, you know, like, you know, they're like not these big beautiful mushrooms, but like. They do grow pro prolifically, and um, they are—they are definitely—they're good. Very they're good. Worth it. Okay, I like. Very it. much worth it. I I I will take that uh, and run with it for sure. Um, all right. So, if I want to do this, I mean, in the beginning, this is just like growing cubes. We're we're expanding culture. We're we're putting it to grain. Um, you know, I mean, fermenting wood chips is not rocket science. Just find some halfway clean hardwood chips somewhere, put them in a barrel, drain them out, you know, dry them out a little bit. I, I, this, again, if you can grow cubes, it's a little different, but you should be able to do this as long as you do the work. It's just the work's different. It's not all in a lab. You got to be outside. You, you got to, you know, pay attention to stuff. You know, I, I got a little ravine in the back corner of my property, a lot of shady uh, area back there. I got a bunch of big trees, got got some white oaks, got some silver maples, got some shag bark hickories, got a couple cherry trees. It's like a nice little deciduous forest back there. But I got a couple open areas relatively flat. I'm, I think I'm going to have to do some some wood chip beds and see what we can get going. Although now you got me, I might have to isolate my ovoids. My, I might have to like lay a tarp out or something. You, you're just gonna want to leave them a good ten feet away from anything else. I think. Yeah, I, I, you got me a little worried now. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, uh, I just wanted to make a point that uh, you said you have silver maples. That is my absolute favorite uh, type of a uh, wood chip. Uh, oh, it is. I, I think. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, late winter harvested. Um, hardwoods are the best like if you if you think about it uh think about it like the 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 people that grow um grow maples for maple syrup when do they harvest that right no and the reason why that maple syrup is in there is because that tree is uh you know it's it's 
it's holding all those nutrients in for the in, like for the coming growing season. So right. the very best time to uh, get chips is from chips that have been freshly harvested from um, that season because they're they're holding all those nutrients in in preparation for the coming growing season. So that is the best type of wood to get for uh, growing wow. mushrooms. Now, so for us, it would probably be late fall. Nobody's cutting trees down and chipping them up in the dead of winter here in Ohio. But um, yeah, that that's really fascinating. No, like with like, do you guys get ice storms and stuff? I mean, yeah, we we not regularly, but yes, we uh, occasionally will get some. Hmm. So you're yeah, saying just we can play. if you lose a tree, hang on to it, have it chipped up in the spring. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or okay. no, no, like no. If if a tree is if a tree, if a tree has been chipped and like you know in late winter, that is or, or like you know branches or whatever branches come down in winter. Right. There's like you know there's winds blowing around. People realize it's a problem tree because it half fell on their house or something. Right. It gets chipped out. There's usually a lot of chips around that time because it's like you know it's that at the end of the winter trees have had enough they've had snow they've had ice they've had rain and like right. branches fall and they get chipped up and like those are absolutely the best chips to use oh now, now, now you're gonna have to start a, a little sub spin off of wood lovers united it's gonna have to be chip hunters united it's like <laughs> hunting for good wood chips man yeah it's a big part of it Dude, I tell you what, I can for sure feel like in a couple years, I, I do feel like these exotics, the, some of the wood lovers are going to be set in the bar for a lot of these experiences, a lot of the medicinal benefits of psilocybin. And I could easily see somebody making a living just going around collecting really high quality wood chips, you know, hunting Artisanal. <laughs> our, yes, I love it. That. Yes. <laughs> artisanal wood chips. I mean, yeah, but, artisanal but, blend. Yes, that is great. I love that. That's all right. Somebody out there, if you're looking for your little Myco hustle, that might be it. We might have created it for you. Now, I'm in an area where there's a lot of Amish woodworkers. I got people offering me sawdust all the time, but the wood lovers want chips. Right. They yeah. don't want sawdust. The issue with the sawdust is um like I like and I haven't tried this myself. It's it's honestly just a, it's just a theory on my part, but I think if you mixed it with like coarse vermiculite or something, it would probably work fine. But mm -hmm. sawdust on its own, um, it doesn't have enough air pockets and stuff and they really yeah, do it's... value that air. It's 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 it because most of these things that we call wood lovers aren't actually wood lovers. Okay. They're grass lovers. They love cellulose, which wood is okay. full of. Uh, but like the most of most of them, I mean, like I guess ovoids would be probably an outlier that is like really a wood lover. But they're so aggressive that they can crawl through the soil and they can find what they need. Right. Um, but oh, so you're as, saying as most as, of these don't grow directly on a piece of wood. Naturally, um, like cyanescence, asbestos, uh, subaruginosa, uh, like. Um, subsecotioides like uh, like these ones like they mostly grow you know in grass right they grow out of grass like because like it's a, then and you know it's uh it's annual grasses they die off the grass like you know the grass falls down it integrates itself into the soil and they grow off of grass so it's funny we call them wood lovers they do wood lo they do love wood but like naturally there's not usually just wood chips you know in nature right. without humans right. making wood chips Interesting. Yeah. All right. Cool, man. Well, sorry, so, I digress. <laughs> no, that was a good digression. I, I I like that one. So so all right. So this summer, this spring and summer, my plan is to start working on some outdoor beds. I got other people coming on talking about it. You are definitely ushering in uh, a new era of people really getting interested uh, more broadly. You know, some of you guys have already always been there. You guys have a thriving uh, Facebook group, but I, I think the interest is growing for sure. So much so that you are stepping out of just the, the Facebook world and into the real world, right? Absolutely. And that kind, of, right. uh, that kind of leads me to uh, my whole mission statement. Um, so I've been a part of Wood Lovers United for a few years now. Um, a couple of years back, uh, it was during, you know, it was during the pandemic year back when, like, you know, 
people were online a lot more and right. they're looking at stuff and they're like looking at stuff to forage around their area and whatnot. And um, like, that's when our group really started to blow up and people had uh, got a large interest in uh, Celospi Azarescence. And um, right. people came out in droves to the coast. Uh, mm -hmm. There was just, I mean, like there's weekend warriors from all places, like in states and countries, and they came out to the coast and they were out there just stomping all over the entire area and raking up dune grass. Um, they were literally using rakes, um, leaving trash all over the place. Like, I mean, just like leaving areas just level and desolate. And uh, I mean, like, yes, like uh, there's the big conversation about like, you know, like you could pick apples from a tree and, you know, like it's then like mushrooms are like apples. But if if you stomp all over the tree, and cut a bunch of holes in it and shit and take the apples, like there's good likelihood you're gonna kill it. <laughs> like, right. And uh, so, I mean, there was a lot of that that went on and there was a lot of outrage from the people that, you know, have been picking these areas like responsibly for years and years. And then suddenly like this patch is dead now because, you know, you had a hundred tourists crawling all over it. Um, and I couldn't help but feel partially responsible for that uh as being part of the group i felt that i needed to do something so i thought about it and i was like what can i do to you know remediate this well you're not gonna the the cat's out of the bag you're not gonna be able to you're not gonna be able to like un secret right. the secret like people know about it they're gonna show up they're gonna come there they're gonna disrespect it so what can we do um so step one of my plan is um, just making basically nature reserves for uh, azurescence in areas where people can't make it too easily. Um, I have uh, an event that I do yearly. It's a private event, um, invite only. Um, and it's in a secret, it's always in a secret location because I don't want that secret getting out. Um, okay. So we're, we're working on making private reserves up and down the coast. Um, where we we just kind of go out and we inoculate areas that um, that are out of the azurescence normal growth range and um, just in areas that um, are perfect for it. So that's that's part one of the plan is uh, just kind of expanding the territory. Uh, part two of the plan has always been um, teaching people and um, helping people learn how to do this themselves because you know if they can grow their own mushrooms in their backyard, there's no reason to go out and search for them. Uh, so I've been working on um, developing techniques to make it as simple as possible for anybody of any skill level to be able to go out and um, or to be able to grow their own mushrooms in their backyard, around town, in the park, wherever they want. And um, I have a series of uh, workshops that I'm working on. I have one coming up in Portland, I believe. Um, I'll give you the link to that later. later. Yeah. And um, I will also be doing a, another um, presentation at the Psychedelic Convergence um, going on just outside of Portland in a few weeks, um, which you also have linked to. And awesome. uh, yeah, we'll have links to all that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that is uh, that's my mission. More that. patches and more places. <laughs> more patches, more places, more people with their own patches. I mean, absolutely. You know, I I think that's a really phenomenal way of thinking about remediating the situation. There are, of course, some of those people you just not gonna you can't fix stupid. You can't fix I don't give a fuck about anything but myself. But there are plenty of people, especially in that neck of the woods, who, if they knew it was relatively easy to have their own private little patch of these. They 100% would, you know, not be stomping around, not be raking up dune grass, not be doing all this crazy stuff that they're doing if they had a much easier way of getting the same result. So, I, man, I commend you. I think that's great. I also think it's great. I'm I'm personally in an era where I've been online. You can only do so much online. There is so much resources online right now. But what I really thrive on, what I really enjoy is meeting and connecting with other people that love mushrooms as much as I do, building those relationships, 
uh, practicing the lost art of talking to people face to face. You know, it's it's good for <laughs> us. It's good for us. Even it, is. All, it really is. It's easy these days to go get away from me. I like my solitude. I like my privacy. I like to do this all day. But it is not how human beings have worked for the last minimum hundred thousand years. Like we're, no, we're very it's, social. It's, it's, we gotta get yeah, it. Yeah, we're we're wired for this. Um, yeah, and yeah. So, so that's great. So you got so you're doing uh, some workshops in Portland. You're doing the psychedelic convergence. Uh, shout out to Alan Rockefeller, Mandy Quark, Jordan Jacobs. Um, who else is going to be there? Sydney Over Singleton. Oh yeah, Sydney's going to be there. You. Um, it's going to be cool, man. That, yeah, that's that, there's a, a hell of a lineup at that, at that event. It's going to be, it's going to be a, like yes. something that should not be list, uh, missed. I, I'm hoping that they're not like, uh, already sold out. Um, there's only they're a limited get, amount I of think, tickets, but I think they're getting close, man. I think they're doing, yeah, we should fine. be close. I'd be kind of surprised if we weren't already, um, at the limit, but, uh, yeah, we will be, uh, we'll be working on, um, I believe like um I will be involved in that and we're gonna be working on making that a bit larger. And um awesome. I'm also planning my own event next year. Um at, at this point it's just um at this point it's just an idea. But uh yeah, like because I have my own like small like camping event where we go out and uh expand uh areas of adolescence, but I'm thinking about making a full blown festival next year, so stay tuned for that. Ooh. I can tell you the there is no short support. Two things that this mushroom community can't get enough of: festivals and content. You just can't you can't do enough of it. So I I say go for it, man. I think it's a great idea, especially if you have kind of a mission statement behind it, and you, people can get around that mission. I think that's that would be great, and, and yeah. bring awareness to like yo grow your own damn assies like yeah. respect the environment <laughs> respect your your natural environment yes 100 percent. that's great man so yeah so guys watching we're we will have links to all that in the description below so if you're wondering how do i find out more about that just go look at the description it's gonna be right there um all right let's do this before we go uh jack sent me a bunch of cool photos and uh we can't leave without taking a look at some of these gross here so let's pull these up all right, so you just walk me through what we got here, besides an alien hanging out with some ovoids. <laughs> well, the alien's looking pretty happy right there, but yeah, that's the, so, so we have a, um, so this last year, um, I believe most of the photos that we have on this list are from um, my uh, greenhouse grow that I had last year, which is, uh, greenhouses are completely unnecessary, but they are very good because, uh, what we have, uh, you know, in the Pacific Northwest is a lot of rain. Mushrooms love rain, but um, they don't like being drowned either. Like they breathe oxygen just like you and I do. So, uh, yeah, so uh, too much rain, the mycelium gets drowned, the, they stop rooting. Um, so, yeah, greenhouses are a thing. All right, let's see what, what we have up. What's like next? It. That is a subrug and like, Oh man, I don't even know if I could say this. That is Subaruganesis sense mycelium. This is actually this is actually a species out of South Africa. It's a uh, um, related oh. to um, Salaspia ovoideosystiata. Um, but the mycelium on this stuff is absolutely mad, and it grows like crazy. I have not fruited it yet. I'm hoping I'm hoping to get it to fruit uh, this summer. I believe it's a warm weather fruiting species, um, right. and it's the it, and yeah, where where uh, is this one from? Where do you say it? Was South from? Africa. South Africa, cool. Okay. Yeah. I dig it. I dig it. So it's like kind of like Subaruganosa, but Subaruganosa sense. That's uh yeah, it's cool. weird. Okay. So so these are some more ovoids that are growing next to my frog pond. The glass is done by my my lovely girlfriend, um, Raquel or oh, sorry, cool, Raquel. Rocky. Rocky Nelson. <laughs> um and uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, absolutely amazing artwork. Nice. All right, man. That's uh, so. So in your greenhouse, you also have a frog pond. Yes, absolutely. I like because I believe uh, I believe completely in um, uh, organic gardening, and the frogs yeah. keep down on uh, you know the frogs keep frogs. down on the slugs yeah. and snails, yeah. and uh, yeah. 
That's awesome. So they're a big part of the whole thing. Uh, here we have a uh, Salaspi uh, Subaruganosa. Um, it has ties to Salaspi Macaroy uh, out of, um, mm -hmm. and this comes from the um, from North Island, New Zealand, um, from Aucklandia, or no, sorry, Auckland. Auckland. <laughs> um, yeah, Auckland, New Zealand, down to uh, Hamilton, New Zealand. Um, they grow really on the north part of the island. Um, so they're good. Um, they're they're still cold weather species, but they like to come up uh, usually a little bit before our native in Pacific Northwest regions. Nice. And here we have another one. It's uh, the ovoids uh, next to the frog pond. That's the. I mean, right? Everybody tells you if you're looking for ovoids, you know. Flood, flood uh plains next to rivers yeah so there's your there there's your little uh river your little frog pond. yeah and and these guys they just they grew straight through the like i mean like this is on like okay it's like you can't see it here but like um on the other side of this is the chip bed that was ovoids the ovoids grew through the soil and then just came up through the soil over there wow yeah. like there's no chips over there they, they just they didn't grew care. over there. No. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> they just grew over there from the patch. Uh, okay, so we have some more ovoids here. So this is actually uh, my own specific uh, variety. I would love to. Uh, I would love to claim, um, you know, responsibility for the way that they turned out. But it was just chance that I ha I happened to stumble across these genetics um, from wild spore print that came from the East Coast. And uh, yeah, they grow way thicker, and they're all wavy like this, and light colored, and uh, I call them void bees. But I yeah, like those them. are my voids. Yeah. Dude, here's what oh, I really like. I'm gonna tell you this. They're incredibly potent too, man. I I, I ate one mushroom a while back. A single mushroom. <laughs> if, 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 if you look at if you look at my photo, um. On another one of my groups, it's uh, thinking outside the cube. Okay. Um, yeah. So if you look at uh, my photo, um, it's the group cover photo because it got voted on. It's kind of embarrassing on my part, but <laughs> that, that was me like trying to remain happy and almost freaking out after eating a like one wow. mushroom that was like that was about two point eight grams, I think, dried. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, man. Those those are beasts. Um, I'll tell you what I like. I like that. You know, of course, in the cube community, there is just a million isolations. There's a million crosses. There's a hundred thousand names. Uh, you know, uh, fifty being added every minute. I love now that there are Paniola cyanescence crosses. I love that there's pan isolations, and and I love that you just right here on the show just were like, "This is my my ovoid isolation." Yes, we need more of this that same mentality and and methodology can be transcribed onto any of these species and that is how this community is going to continue to grow and evolve and actually bring things to the table for for Absolutely. this very cool thing that we're a part of right now so i love that i have a slospy uh cyanescent variation as well it's um uh I call them Jack and Jill's because they are uh, created between a, a collaboration between me and uh, Jill Ramos. Oh, um, cool. they, yeah, they grow thick and meaty and are ugly as hell, but also kind of beautiful. <laughs> uh, and that's so, the, the Slosophy Cyanescence? Yeah. Oh, cool. Nice. Jack right, and Jill. Uh, yeah, so this is another one from uh, the Subaroganescence. All right. Yeah, that is some wiling out little it's mycelium. It's just some straight up rabid mycelium, yeah. <laughs> um, these ones, they look a lot like um, azurescent species, but these are actually Seperuginosa. Ah, uh, okay. Same ones we pictured earlier. Um, this is another patch. This is actually what those ovoids look like um, while growing outdoors. So you can still see how like beefy and chunky the types are. Yeah. Um, but they're much darker as far as the caps are concerned, and um, they grow in uh, massive clusters. Yeah, I've seen that. Um, Happy's recently done some photos, and sometimes I don't, I can't tell 
if it's just because they're younger or where they're growing or if it's a moisture thing. But yeah, they get a real dark cap at some some locations. Now, when these yeah, grow usually up, usually when they're young, when they're first pinning, they're usually very dark, um, especially ah, outdoors. Okay. But um, yeah, but so uh, these ones, up. yeah, yeah, now, they do light this? up. So on the right here, the the fruit just above your logo. Mm -hmm. Man, what the hell annulus is that? It's like it's like it has a sleeve or a sheath that it's in. <laughs> what is that? And then even some know. of these uh, we'll, others. We'll, maybe we'll call that ovoid. Um, ovoids uh, uncut or cut. <laughs> exactly. There you go. An uncut ovoid. Yeah, man, these are gnarly. Um, this was uh, this was uh, when my these are Celeste azarescence and this was uh, when they first were coming up. This is a clone culture of mine, and um, okay. uh, it has uh, it tends to fruit extremely early. This was in my greenhouse during I think it was about like maybe September twentieth, but before temperatures had even really started started dropping. So I mean, like daytime temperatures were between in in that greenhouse. They're probably between I don't know good. 70 and 80 degrees nighttime maybe down to 50 but the soil level you know is a good 65 degrees right. and uh like these these started fruiting weeks before anything else did in there uh -huh. uh, i don't know let's skip that one <laughs> okay so we have some more azorescence these are lovely yeah these look great And another one of these beast voids. That's a just a regular sized uh, Lego guy. That's a good uh, inch thick stipe on that thing. Yeah, look at that stipe, man. And these are again the um, the Subaruganosa from uh, North Island, New Zealand. Nice. And again, Subaruganosa from North Island, New Zealand. Lovely. And these guys, that that little uh, that little salamander there, um, they were coming out a lot in uh, earlier, or like you know, in fall, and my cats kept on catching them. So I saved them and put them in the greenhouse, and they helped keep the slug and snail population down. Oh, that's so cool. And, and these are these are the same as those. Yeah, yeah, those are the same. Cool. What are they called? Like, jelly something, right? Yeah, jelly subs. Jelly that's subs, that's yeah. their yeah little nickname, and you can really see the jelly in the uh, salamander picture. Like they they oh, have like God, this yeah. translucent look when they're nice and wet like that, and uh, that's that's what gives them the name. And this is a canopy of jelly subs. This is what they look like when they get a little bit older. Okay. And again, jelly subs. Gorgeous. They grew like mad, man. I've I've never had a canopy of like an outdoor grow canopy like that before. It was just like it was insane. Those things produce incredibly I mean, well. They're on top of one on top of another on top of another. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I mean I I I, <laughs> I pulled a half pound dry off of a like a two and a half foot by two and a half foot patch. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, these these are very attractive. I do you sell these uh prints? Yes. The the jelly sub, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I have I have prints of everything I have. Um this is a really interesting one. This is the Indian Woodlover. Um that's what we're calling it right now because it is not officially oh. named. It has it has close genetic ties to Psilocybe uh Wayana Densens and Psilocybe Tyragoneo maculans. Um okay. But it is it is different uh, macroscopically than both of them, and um, it is a warm weather fruiting um, wood lover, which is a uh, this is going to be great for um, your your listeners that are down south in humid areas or anybody who has a greenhouse. Um, these will these will fruit easily out of wood chips, uh, doing the same process as anything else. Um, but they need a lot of warmth and a lot of humidity and dark area. Uh, okay. Not not dark, but shaded, like very much okay. because these grow out of the jungles of uh, of India um, during monsoon season. So they like lots of moisture, lots of humidity, and lots of shade. Man, those are 
crazy looking. This is an insane azurescence that grew out of the edge of my patch. And um, oh, what was the weight on that? Uh, I think it was like 31, 31 grams wet or something like that. It seems like it should have been, but I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's, and it's like it's got those wavy edges and everything on it. Um, I I am um, running a clone culture of that um, this year, so we'll see what happens from that. I hope good things. Okay, uh, this is again the Indian wood lover. Um, some of them grow kind of more normally, but some of them just do this crazy frilly, like wavy thing that they do. Man. I'm wishing I was in Florida. I'd love to try to grow these. These are looking pretty cool. Well, you can so, pop a greenhouse that, up in your backyard, and that's what I got to do. That's what do I'm doing. I'm, 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 I'm thinking. I'm thinking. There's gonna be a lot more greenhouses this year. I guarantee it. Oh yeah, gonna have to be. This is again the uh, azurescence, some like early fruiters from September. Now, are are these flowers placed, or are they growing in there as well? It, well, they are growing in there, but I may have uh, placed them somewhat and kind of nice. pulled them over into the shot yeah. for the shot. Oh. But yeah, no, that that's those are uh, uh, nasturtiums, and they grow oh, right. like crazy. They, they make great ground cover um, for wood lovers, but um, they don't last all the way through the fruiting season. Um, oh. They, but they make ground great ground cover for when um, they are um, colonizing and. Uh, Right. just to kind of keep things moist and stuff but they don't last like all the way throughout the fruiting season they kind of die off at the beginning well i just love i i mean you know the little gray alien the lego guys the the flowers i mean it sure makes for for a great photo uh it, it, <laughs> it's it's very cool i love you know put a little thought into your photos just yeah absolutely take, take a minute put a little just pin a little flare on there <laughs> yes, do something. Buy some sparklers. I don't care what you do, but do something. <laughs> yes. Cool, man. Well, I can tell you this. I'm very excited about growing some stuff outdoors. Uh, you are definitely a major reason for for a growing excitement and interest in, in this this area for myself. I know a lot of other people absolutely love your presence on uh wood lovers united and uh, i think you have done a lot of great work in a very short period of time i commend you on that um i wish you well in in your workshops coming up your efforts uh in oregon i i anytime you you want to toot your horn you let me know i will definitely let people know <laughs> what's going on and uh you know if you got a workshop coming up you got an event you, you just let me know. We'll we'll get you on to shout it out for a few minutes or however long you want to chit chat about it. And yes, we will do that. Right on. Thanks, man. And uh, just uh, I had to plug. I have to plug one last thing. Uh, me and a small group of people are working on um, uh, a section Zapoticorum uh, undescribed, an undescribed section Zapoticorum uh, out of New Zealand. Um, it is quite possibly the most potent species ever tested. Um, wait, we're going wait, wait, to sorry, some... sorry. What? I think my, my headphones are not working. Let me, let me see if I'm following you correctly here. Did you just say there is a New Zealand zap? Uh, it is in section Zapotecorum. It... So it's, 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 what? it is related, but is not a Zapotecorum specifically. Okay. Aucklandiae, Aucklandiae is also a New Zealand species that is, that is in section okay. Zapotecorum. Um, this one, um, it is not, uh, it has only been discovered in one spot, and that spot has now been paved over and um, is now a parking lot. So it is uh. quite possible that this species is extinct in nature. Um, we have been working with it. Um, and we may be releasing it to the public soon. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. I'm not going to tell the last little uh, little bit about it. I'm going to wow. keep that one to myself for now. But uh, there is uh, something very special that it does. All right. So timeline us here. Where, where are we at? A month out, two months out, a year out? Give me a We're rough talking. Month. We're going to talk um, anywhere from a month 
to four. Okay. Before that's released. And um, it is also easily cultivatable at home under regular conditions. Um, but it's going to be big. It's going to be a game changer. Well, put me down for a print. I absolutely definitely want to grow this stuff. Uh, so you guys really think this might be the most potent fruit ever? There's a good possibility, yeah. What? All right, guys. You guys got to rev your engines. You got to you got to find you uh you, you know some wood chips and start uh getting going on this train that's happening right now of growing all these unique special philosophies and, and, and other active species um that that Jack is doing such a great job championing um but man New Zealand just hitting hard man out of the gate so many interesting things happening in Australia and New Zealand uh pretty exciting stuff man I mean, I don't like a long plane flight, but dear God, it's making me want to go there for sure. Yeah, I'm gonna have to make it out there in the next year for sure. All right. Well, well, let's let we might need to figure out how to get. We, let's bring a couple people over there and come hang out. I, I I think. Let's do it. We'll make something. I. I don't know. Just too many cool things are happening over there right now. Uh, just had Kane Barlow on. He definitely got me excited about some of the stuff going on over there. Yeah, I think it could be a good time. Cool, man. Well, that was a uh, cherry on top. If the pictures were the icing on the cake, that was definitely the cherry on top. I love it. That's very exciting. Again, thank you for just following your interest and your passion and staying genuine and focused on the shit that matters and not the shit that doesn't matter. Uh, Got to have more people like that in the community. Really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me, man. And everybody out there, think outside the cube. All right, guys. That was Jack Cyan. Uh, he's got a lot of cool stuff going on right now. Uh, I don't know about you. I think I got to grow some mushrooms outside. I mean, I don't know how I how I can't not give it a try. If you live uh, anywhere where you got a little bit of property, and man, you got to, I mean, just even if all you're doing is inoculating some wood chips, putting it in a little grow sack or something like that, it could be fun. And, and I don't know about you guys, but for me, I really want to experience some of these other mushrooms, some of the uh, unique therapeutic benefits that that can come from things other than cubes. So uh, I will be giving that a go. Expect more content around that. Um, more people are going to be on here in in the coming months. Uh, talking about growing mushrooms outside. So stay tuned for that. Hope hope you guys like that. Let me know if, if you're like, what are you doing? Why are you wasting my time? All I want to do is grow cubes over and over again. Cool, just let me know. If you guys are excited about this content and you want to see more of it, also, you know, let me know in the comments. I appreciate it. All right, so until next week, go grow some mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs>